Okay, so hello everyone. So we're here today because at the beginning of the year, uh, a lot of your traffic, a lot of your web requests might have gone through Go. And that's because at Cloudflare, we decided to use Go to experiment with TLS 1.3, a change that your browser probably noticed and you hopefully didn't. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. So what is TLS anyway? TLS is a transparent security protocol used in a number of applications. It's used for uh, mail servers, it's used for Tor nodes, but most commonly it's used uh, in HTTP to make HTTPS, the green lock in the browser, sorry. Uh, TLS is, <coughs> provides a secure tunnel uh, over an insecure network like the internet. And how it works is that it sets up some shared key material across the two endpoints of the connection to encrypt your traffic while it goes through. And to set up that shared key material, it uh, uses a, it, it sets up that shared key material during the handshake. The handshake is this process that starts as soon as you open a new TLS connection, and it involves some communication between the two parts of the connection, client and server. In TLS 1.2, what you're seeing here, what has been the gold standard for almost a decade now, uh, there are two round trips. So <laughs> there are two steps in the handshake. Uh, the client sends uh, something, the server responds. The client sends something else, the server responds something else. And then you're ready to exchange application data. So this, as I said, has been the standard for the last nine years now. But over the last few years, the cryptography community has been working on a new revision of the TLS protocol. It's called TLS 1.3, and it brings a number of robustness and security changes. But the most visible change is that it cuts that handshake of two round trips in half down to one round trip, making the latency cost of TLS half as long. And not only that, but for connections that are resumed, so connections that go to some website to which you connected in the past, it allows zero RTT connections, where there is no latency cost to TLS at all, because as soon as the client starts sending uh, things over the wire, it's ready to send application data, for example, a HTTP request. And the server can respond immediately in the second flight. So, of course, TLS is implemented by Go in the standard library in the crypto TLS package. What you might not know is that crypto TLS is very good, to the point that that's what cryptographers look at when we don't understand something in TLS. And that's because it's a modern and simple implementation of a small subset of TLS, a small useful subset of TLS. And of course, it's written in Go. So the API is pretty simple. It, expose, uh, it wraps a net.com under, uh, underneath. So for example, a TCP connection. And it exposes another net.com on the other side that you can use in your application and that will automatically encrypt that and pass it to the underlying netcom. Normally, TLS uh, libraries have this very wide API surface that controls a complex state machine for more or less defined. But crypto TLS simplified the, the protocol parts that it's implementing to the point that it can just serialize the state machine with just a couple if statements and expose the whole thing under a single function call, a single method, handshake, which does, well, the handshake. So to make it even simpler then, it, the first call to read or write on the netcom will invoke handshake for you. So you can use a tls.com just like any other transparent netcom and it will automatically encrypt the data that you send through the connection and authenticate the other side based on the config that you passed when you created the tls.com. How it works internally is of course that First, Handshake takes ownership of the netcon and exchanges the first messages, the client hello, the server hello, to start setting up the connection. It agrees on the keys and then it instantiates the cipher suite to encrypt the data. Then Handshake 
go, starts going through the ciphers to communicate with the netcon and completes the handshake. Once the handshake is complete, all the calls for, uh, to read and write from outside the TLSCon, part of what makes the uh, crypto TLS implementation so simple is that it delegates uh, all, it makes sure that only the higher level functions need to know about the state of the protocol. And lower level functions only have the role of parsing or decrypting or whatever it is that they're doing at their stage. So let's go for a concrete example. This is from the crypto TLS source. There's a function called server handshake, and at one of the stages, it needs to read a message to receive some information from the client. So it calls read message. Sorry, it calls read handshake. Read handshake, in turn, calls read record a number of times. And read record fills this buffer, and it calls read record until the buffer has enough data to read the message it's trying to read. Records are the smallest unit of encrypted data in TLS. So in TLS, you have this uh, small structure that has a type, a version, a length, and then an encrypted payload. That payload is decrypted, and inside there, you find the plain text. The plain text can be either some application data or some handshake messages based on the type. So read record will go and decrypt the relevant piece of the, of the record using whatever cipher was configured. Of course, there's Go, so there's a cipher interface. And based on what type it is, it's invoked based on whether it's ASGCM or whichever it is that was set up. It uh, saves this into a block structure that is essentially a fancy buffer and returns to read record. Read record looks at the type of the record it just received and acts based on what the type was. It doesn't know what's happening higher up in the stack. So if it found uh, alert, well, alerts are usually fat fatal, so it just closes the connection. If it found some application data, it adds it to the application data buffer, the C dot input. And if it found a handshake, instead, it adds it to the handshake buffer. Then read handshake um, obtains what was just read by the read record, makes sure it was a handshake message. And based on the type of the message, deserializes it into the Go structure of that message. I'm not showing you the parsers because they're pretty uninteresting, except as a case study on how to make uh, uns write unsafe code in a memory safe language. But the point is that we now have a unserialized handshake message. And that's returned by read handshake to our server handshake function. We're back to the top. And the server handshake knows at what point of the handshake it is and makes sure that it got the right message by doing a type assertion on the structure it just received. So this is the flow of data inside crypto TLS. With TLS 1.3, it got a little more complex, of course, because there are a number of states in which the handshake can still be uh, ongoing, but there might be application data being exchanged because the server can start answering immediately, doesn't have to wait for the confirmation from the client, and of course, the client might send zero TT data. <clears throat> As I was saying, zero TT brings challenges, of course, in internals, but also in API design because zero-TT data is different. So zero-TT data is, uh, does not benefit from all the guarantees of the TLS protocol. TLS ha guarantees that your data is not replayed. That means that I can't record your TLS session with your bank when you're, for example, making a wire transfer to me and then play it back against your bank server and make that wire transfer happen again. But with zero TT handshakes, you can't provide that guarantee because how you do that is by echoing something back that the server picked at random. But with zero TT data, you haven't heard anything from the server yet. So you're in no position to protect from replays. So of course, zero TT data is disabled by default because it's more dangerous. The application should be aware of zero TT data and its characteristics. But if you do want to enable it for its performance advantages, you do need some things from the API, TLS API. The two important things are that you need a way to know what is 0RTT data, 
so that you know whether something is safe or not. And you know you need a way to wait until the zero TT data is again safe to use. Because when the client finally gets back to you, it's proving that it wasn't replayed. So the first option that we start with, of course, is the idea of a config uh, boolean, a simple accept zero TT flag. But of course, that doesn't let us make any decision based on what is zero TT data and what is not. So that's not enough. The second thing we considered was a separate function, handshake with zero RTT, that accepts a connection, receives the zero TT data, returns the zero TT data, and then you can do whatever you want with it. This seems to work, but it breaks one of the nicest things about Go. In Go, we can compose interfaces. That's exactly what we're doing with TLS.com. If you, if you wanted, for example, to wrap your TLS.com in a gzip reader, you could just wrap the gzip reader around the TLS.com, which in turn is wrapped around the, th the TCP.com. And when you read from the gzip reader, you are reading something that is automatically decrypted and decompressed. But now, if some of the data went somewhere else, didn't go through the reader, interface, but was returned by this handshake with zero RTT call, now the gzip reader would be broken because it would accept some headers that would be lost. So we can't do this without forcing everyone to make weird, some kind of glue wrappers to make sure that then readers work again. And we definitely don't want to break one of the nicest things about Go interfaces. So the second option we considered over the months is a uh, callback function in the config that would go and check that the zero TT data is safe or not to, co uh, to compute. And if it were, was safe, it would make it available on the normal reader. That seems to work, but if you try to actually use it, you realize that it still subtly breaks composability. Because what are you going to do when that data, for example, is HTTP? Are you going to parse HTTP2 manually? Are you going to copy paste things from the HTTP2 standard library just to parse the first part? Of course not. So you would be, again, in no position to make a real decision on this data until you receive it through the reader, which would be too late. So here's what we settled on. The first part is a connection state field. Connection state is a structure that is returned by an aptly named connection state method on the TLS connection that tells you whether the handshake is at this point confirmed or not. It tells you if the zero TT data is, um, is still replayable or if we're later in the connection so everything is safe. So when you're handling a HTTP connection, you can call connection state to decide whether or not you should service this dangerous HTTP request that, for example, is making a transaction. And then the main part of the API, a confirm handshake function call that allows you to block, to wait, if you decide that, no, I'm not going to actually process this data. If you decide that it's not safe to process the zero TT data if it's replayable, you can call this function, and it will start buffering all the reads until it reaches the client finished, which guarantees that everything is fine. When that happens, it returns nil, you know that everything is fine, and you can carry on handling the request without going back or anything. So, of course, the main problem of this is it that it requires buffering. That's unavoidable, because if you think about it, when you decide that you're not going to keep processing this request, the TLS library will have to read through all the rest of the zero TT data before it reaches the finished message. That, of course, is a danger for memory exhaustion, because if an attacker starts sending you data and never stopping, it could fill your, uh, your entire memory. So what we did is that we added a feature to the protocol itself to limit the size of the zero TT data so that these buffers can get too big. Now, the last thing we need to do is somehow expose this API to the HTTP handler because that's likely where we will want to make the decisions. So for that, of course, uh, I looked at the standard library for inspiration. And the standard library already exposes things like the remote address and the server object through uh, context keys. So 
with the recently introduced context, you can obtain the context for a request from your handler, and then use the context keys to obtain some contextual information. I added a tlscon context key that allows you to retrieve the tlscon object, on which then you can call connection state to know if it's 0TT, and then confirm handshake if you decide that 0TT is not okay today. So, of course, TLS 1.3 being a major revision, it brings a number of other API changes. That number is zero. Because TLS 1.3 is all about safe defaults. So, I took a very conservative stance on what APIs to add. And I'm curious to see how far we can get without even adding a way to configure the Cypher suite. TLS comes with a negotiation protocol, so it can work out with the server what Cypher suite to use. And Go now is smart enough to use the fastest one for your architecture even. So I didn't add any other knob because I don't think you as application developers really care about whether you're using ChaCha20, Poly1305, or ASGCM with HMAC SHA256, right? So, you can see the whole diff of the API changes, but they're mostly indeed some constant values and the zero TT API. What did get more complex, though, is of course some of the internals, because with all this confirmation architecture, we need to be careful about locking. The locking situation was already complex, because we had one lock for the handshake, of course, and one lock for each side of the connection, reading and writing. You can't interleave records. They would become undecryptable. So you also have to keep in mind that read and write call handshake. So they will block on a handshake when the handshake is not completed yet. And finally, handshake will need to read some data sequentially. So it will need to hold the read lock. And sometimes it will need to hold the write lock because it will need to send some answers. So you can already see if you look closely that if you take the locks in the wrong order, you risk a situation where you have a read call in flight that blocks the read lock. And then you call write, which calls handshake as the first thing. And if the handshake blocks first the in lock, it will start locking on the read lock until read returns. But what happens if in your protocol you don't get an answer, you don't get a read, until you send something with a write. It's a deadlock. So how this is sold in the standard library is with a sync.com. Whoever used sync.com? One, two, three. Thanks, Elena. Uh, <laughs> so I was actually very happy when I found out that it was using sync.com, because I never understood what it's for. I never understood how it works, and I never seen it used. So it was like, Perfect, I can study this case, and I'll get to the end that I know how to use it, I know where you use it, and when you use it. And I get to the end, and I have a CL to remove, uh, remove sync.com, because I think you can do it without. So I still don't know how sync.com works. But I did have to add a number of other things to the locking strategy. Because as we said, there is confirm handshake, which can be called concurrently by multiple HP requests, for example. HP handlers. And reads that happen after the confirm handshake will block on the confirm hand, uh, mutex. And finally, there is close, of course, which has to lock on handshake to know whether the handshake is done or not. And based on whether the handshake is done or not, it will have to write something to let the other party know that it's closing the connection, unless there was a write uh, in flight already, which means that probably you're calling close to unblock that write, so we shouldn't block on that lock. So there is this weird loop of atomic calls, and locking is a mess. But if you want to provide some feedback and review, indeed, to all this, the, there is this CL, which is where I removed the sync.com, and I would really appreciate feedback. On my side, what I did to make sure that all this worked is that I tested it with every client library I could get my hands on. I wrapped all of them into Docker containers, and I made them run in a Travis CI uh, setup against my library to make sure that they could send, receive data, zero TT data, do all kinds of handshakes. 
now that so now that we have this tested and modified crypto TLS library, we need some way to use it. And since it's part of the standard library, we can't just import it. We need to slot it back into the, into the standard library. To do that, I have this weird make file that does, essentially it starts by compiling the Go tool chain, then it removes crypto TLS, it links it back to our source, it starts recompiling the standard library, then it compiles some other things, and then there's a shell script, <laughs> and then it's deployed, all right? <laughs> so now that we have a deployed TLS stack that we modified, we need to make it adaptable to the needs of a complex edge like the Cloudflare Edge. And we need to remember that the Cloud for Edge serves many different websites under, on the same IP. So the solution to that exists in the standard library for a long time now, and it's the get certificate callback. How it works is that this is a function you provide that is called every time a new request, a new connection comes in, and it's provided with the SNI, with the name of the website that the client is trying to connect to, because you wouldn't know otherwise just based on the IP. And from that, you can return a certificate for that specific website. But that's not enough for the Cloud for Edge. At the Cloud for Edge, we move the private key operations outside of the actual Edge computation. It's a bit complex. We call it keyless SSL. But the idea is that the private key can be in a separate process, metal, colo, or even country, or even at the customer data center. And all the operations are done remotely. To, thankfully, we were able to slot this very nicely inside the certificate structure that you return from get certificate. Because from keyless, we return, of course, the public key and the public certificate. And then in that crypto.private key interface, we don't return our actual private key, but an implementation of the crypto.signer interface. Don't you love interfaces? Crypto.signer is implemented, of course, by private keys. But we can also implement it on top of the keyless protocol by taking what needs to be signed, sending it over to the keyless server, having it signed remotely, and returning it when it comes back. However, there are things that get certificates still can't do. Because there are things that are configured at the global config object level. For example, the next protocol, which crucially disables or enables HTTP2, which we might want to do on a website basis. The client authentication setting, which was important for the CADDI web server, because if you were enabling a client auth for a single website in CADDI, it was enabled for all the websites you were serving from the same instance. And finally, of course, ZRTT, which we really want to disable on a website basis. So what Go 1.8 added is get config for client. It's a wonderful callback that replaces the config object entirely based on the same client hello info information at the beginning of the connection. To make it even more useful, we added a few client hello info fields, including the underlying net connection, so that we have access to the remote and local IP addresses and we can figure out what website the client is trying to connect to also based on that. The last remaining thing we still don't have is a similar mechanism for session tickets. Session ticket keys deserve to be protected as much as certificate keys. They're even more powerful in TLS 1.2. So of course we want to handle them from the keyless server, but we don't have an API like that crypto signer in certificate to do that. So I put up a proposal on the GitHub um, issue tracker. The name is terrible, Session Ticket Wrapper. It wraps around your mouth and it's terrible. So if you have better pro uh, proposals or you, you want to just join the discussion, it's issue 1999 and you're welcome to come join. So now that we have a flexible uh, t uh, crypto TLS implementation, we need to also make sure that it's fast enough to handle the, the Cloudflare Edge traffic. 
And how we make sure of that is by using a specific subset of the crypto primitives, which over the years were re-implemented in assembly. The first one being the P256 cur elliptic curve implementation that we did at Cloudflare when we needed it for DNSSEC, but also Curve25519, ASGCM, and ChaCha20, which happen to be all the things that TLS 1.3 supports and prefers. So as long as you're using TLS 1.3 or any way, as long as you're allowing Go to choose the cipher suites and you're on x64 architecture, you're going to use these fast implementations, which is important not only for speed, but for security too, because these are guaranteed to be constant time so, that, so they don't have side channel leaks. How, how you do that is by telling Go to prefer the server cipher suite ordering so that it can choose the ones that it prefers, and by specifying the two curves that have assembly implementations in the curve preferences config object. All with me? Okay, so now that we have a working TLS stack, we need to somehow get connections to it, right? At Cloudflare, how everything used to work is that there was an Nginx with OpenSSL that would then pass the connections decrypted to another Nginx on the same machine. How do, do we fit the Go crypto stack in there? What we did is weird. We taught uh, the OpenSSL library to recognize TLS 1.3 connections and to pass them, pass the file descriptor ownership to the Go program along with the client hello it just read. If the Go program accepts that file descriptor, it will then carry on serving that connection without any OpenSSL involvement at all and any performance reduction from the context switch. So how we do this in the standard library, it's pretty easy. You use a specific type of Unix connection that has a read message Unix function to read the packet and some out of bounds data at the same time. Then you use the syscall package to parse this uh, out of bounds data and then another syscall call to turn that uh, parse the structure into file descriptor numbers. You pass the file descriptor numbers to the uh, new file function. You obtain a file uh, object. You pass it to net.filecon uh, so that it can duplicate it and turn it into a net.com. It gets, then you type assert it to make sure that it's a TCP connection. You call the remote address to make sure it wasn't closed in the meantime. And now you're ready to wrap it into a uh, multi-reader to make sure that you use the client hello uh, at the same time. And then you just return it from a listener accept. Is enough, right? <laughs> Later. <laughs> so if you clo look close enough, though, you can clearly see where three days of my life got lost. <laughs> Turns out that FileCon duplicates the file descriptor. And if you don't close the file object you just duplicated, now there are two file descriptors. And what happens if you return the file descriptors to Nginx to say, I don't want anything to do with this, carry on, and then Nginx tries to close it? What happens? Nothing. There's still an open file descriptor copy that you're holding. And so you have to wait for the client to close things, but the server can't close them anymore. And it's a hell of a bug to the bug. But, if you manage to get through all these connection hurdles and decrypt your connection, you will finally find some HTTP traffic inside. And this HTTP traffic, of course, needs to be handled. And of course, we use net HTTP in Go to handle, the, to handle the requests. The first thing you need to know when you're using net HTTP in production is that the default timeouts are not okay for internet use. If you get away one thing from this talk, it must be that you can't use the default timeouts on the open internet. They won't survive. You will start seeing errors like that where accept complains about too many open files because all your file descriptors went out the window. How you do set the timeouts is that by creating a HTTP.server structure and setting at least read, write, and idle timeout. And then using the listen and serve functions on that object. So if you're using the package level listen and serve and exposing it to the internet, you're doing it wrong. You will get paged, all right? Okay. But if you do set the timeouts, what happens is pretty straightforward. 
the HTTP server, as soon as it receives a request, it will set the read and write uh, timeouts in the form of deadlines. This is important to understand. Timeouts are not between one call, one read, and the other. Timeouts are absolute. So they set the absolute time that your request has to complete reading and to complete writing. This is important because if the attacker wanted to mess with you, it would send a slow trickle of data, which costs them almost nothing, and it would keep all your file descriptors occupied anyway. These instead set a maximum number of time that they can hold on to. Or at least they do in 1.8. There were a number of issues before 1.8 with timeouts. Uh, the first of which was that read timeout wasn't resetting when H, um, HTTP2 requests were coming in. So what would happen is that the deadline would be set at the very beginning. Then you would carry on doing a lot of short, nice and easy requests, and at some point that deadline would trigger because it was never reset, never removed, never updated. And requests would just break for no apparent reasons, images would load up to half, and you could possibly spend another three days of your life trying to figure out why. Same things for write timeout. It happened the exact same way, but it was caught later in the cycle. So it wasn't fixed entirely, but it was just neutered. So write timeout means nothing for HTTP2 in Go 1.8. You won't go 1.9 for it to be effective. And finally, it introduced a proper idle timeout. HTTP requests can stay idle when they're not serving requests so that the connection can be reused. The problem was that as soon as the connection switched to idle, the read timeout would start ticking. And you can imagine that if your timeout is a minute and the request comes after 59 seconds, the request has no chance of completing before the timeout hits and breaks up absolutely innocent request. So you want to use Go 1.8 and possibly 1.9. Still, there is one thing that I would love to see introduced in Go 1.10. And it's a way to configure these timeouts from the handlers themselves, on a request-by-request -request basis or on a path-by-path -path basis. This is pretty hard from an API design point of view, but we're working on it on the issue number 1600. The possibilities right now look like either a context object with its uh, native timeouts or the ability to call close on the body to interrupt the request so that you can build your own timeouts. You can come give uh, your opinion on the, on the issue. Finally, you might have heard about TCP keep alives. Do not co um, confuse them for HP timeouts. They're absolutely not the same thing. They're a TCP level per, um, feature that only makes sure that there's still someone on the other side. So if an attacker wants to keep that connection open, it can keep it open forever by just responding to the keep alive pings. What does help is tracking what the open connections are with the con state callback. You don't need to read the slide right now, but you can come back to it when you need to implement these metrics. Sadly, you have to keep state to know which uh, part of the state, mm, the state switches you're doing at any time. Now, the last thing that is very interesting to look at in the HTTP implementation is how it couples with our TLS implementations from before. The HTTP code base type asserts the TLS connection to do some special things when it's a, TCP connect, uh, when it's a TLS connection. And this is why we can't use uh, external TLS library, because it will fail that type assertion in the net HTTP stack. If the type assertion succeeds, the first time it does is that it sets the timeouts, of course, so that it, they will cover the handshake. And then it calls handshake for you. And if handshake fails, it logs a helpful line that tells you that it's not some random request that failed, but the initial handshake of the connection. This is handy, except when you want to somehow drop a connection on the floor from one of the callbacks, like get config for client. If you return an error, it will get logged. And trust me, you can log a lot of things when you're on the Cloud for Edge, including taking down the login pipeline. <clears throat> but uh, if you look closely at the panic recover function, you will notice that it checks if the error is nil. And if it's nil, it doesn't log the panic. Of course, if you panic, you don't hit the 
log line. So what you can do is just panic Neo in your callbacks, and the request will just go away. Now, of course, this is awful. And thankfully, Go 1.8 added a specific error type that you can panic with, not to get yelled at during code reviews. Finally, the last thing it does when it uh, spots a TLS connection, and the most important one, is that it, in, it goes for the next protocol handlers, and most specifically, HTTP2, because HTTP2 is only available over TLS, over HTTPS. So it's interesting to look at when uh, HTTP2 is uh, enabled automatically. It happens when the, you don't configure the next protocol's handlers manually, of course, and you either give the server the TLS config to configure it itself and call listen and serve, or you configure the config manually by adding H2 to the list of next protocols. Something tricky here is that if you use get config for client, you need to configure the outer config, not the inner one. Otherwise, you might be losing three days of your life and turning off HP2 on the cloud edge. Don't do that. But if we made it through all this, we handled the HP request without falling over, we now have to do something with this HP request. So what we uh, need to do in our internal infrastructure is to pass this request to the order Nginx that then will pass it to the caches, the WAF, and everything else down the line. We need a reverse proxy. There is one in HTTP util. It's a partial implementation. It works. It does some weird things. We extended it to dial always to the same origin, because by default, it, it really wants to just connect to the website and do everything itself, while we wanted to route through our Nginx in the backend. Uh, we made sure, so we overrode the dial function to connect only to Nginx. And then we made sure that we had a big enough pool of idle connections. Because this is one of the biggest uh, performance mistakes you can make with a HP transfer. You really want to reuse connections when you're making a lot of requests. But if you keep the default max idle cons per host, which is two, you only get two persistent connections. Because all the other connections you establish they get used for a request, then they check, they see that there are already two idle connections, and they get closed. So all the other 198 connections will keep doing the TCP and TLS handshake and then closing it, doing it and closing it. So with a big enough pool, we can handle traffic spikes because we already have the connections open. Finally, we added some features that we needed, uh, specifically HP to push, which was such a pleasure to, to implement. In, at Calfer, we implemented with a, a header. So your origin sends the header, and we go and fetch the thing you said to fetch. This was a three-month project for the Edge team, and hundreds of lines of Lua. For the Go implementation, it was a two-hour project of 15 lines. Because the HP2 pusher interface just requires you to type a cert, do an interface upgrade, get the pusher object, set up some uh, options where we copy the headers for the new request, and then just call push with the URL. It gets automatically uh, assigned its own go routine, routed through the request handlers, and the response is sent automatically through the HTTP2 connection. It's wonderful. And finally, of course, we added zero RTT with the API I told you at the beginning. So we are wrapping up. We are finally using the uh, context key to retrieve the TLS connection, checking if the connection state is not confirmed yet. And if it's not, we apply the Cloudflare logic, which is to only let through requests that are get and that have no key restraint, on the assumption that you're not changing anything if you're only requesting a page without passing any parameters. If that's the case, we just add the header, and if it's to let the server know, and if it's not, we call confirm handshake. We just wait. And as soon as confirm handshake returns without an error, we know we can proceed. So that's the entire extent of the code we had to add to implement all this logic with the API we added. So this is it. Uh, we didn't break the internet, as you, might, you hopefully noticed. The numbers went up and down based on the client support 
that had to uh, be disabled eventually for third-party issues. But the TLS 1.3 code base is now audited and is uh, in the process of being upstreamed. I hope to get it in for 1.10. You can participate to the review. It's on the dev TLS branch. And the TLS protocol itself is sadly hung because some very bad middle boxes let the connection happen, and then when they can't recognize what's happening, they just close it, which looks exactly like a downgrade attack. So of course, the browser can't do anything else than let the connection die, and when that, this happens so often, you just can't upgrade the protocol. So sadly, we are waiting for either the ecosystem to patch, name and shame, or for the protocol to adopt some horrible, horrible workarounds. But something that's for sure is that crypto TLS and net HTTP in the Go standard library did a wonderful job and were absolutely ready to handle internet connections for the whole Cloudflare Edge. So this is it. You can follow TLS 1.3 on the issue on the issue tracker. You can see the code on GitHub. You can read more on uh, the blog on the tag TLS 1.3. And if you want to expose uh, a Go server uh, to the internet, you can go and read my Gopher Academy blog post uh, that summarizes everything that you need to know. And, and if instead you have problems that look like this one, you might want to hire me. So thank you very much, and do we have time for questions?